I'm Robert Lelouver, um, distinguished professor of psychology, retired from the University of Great Falls. Um, uh, and I've been interested in um, sci-fi and, and science fiction all my life. Um, but I read an interview with Kenneth Ring in the mid-90s about his research um, at the University of Connecticut and found that, that it was one of the most fascinating psychological analyses of uh, abductees, contactees, and sighters. Um, um, and I, I delivered a lecture to the nurses at the um, Northeastern Health Board in Ireland the year I was there as senior clinical psychologist um, on the UFO and abduction phenomenon. Um, and um, one of the nurses says, said, do, do you teach this? And I said, no, I probably should. Um, it was a sort of a latent um, part of me think, my thinking. Um, so I came back in 2003 um, and began a summer course called UFO Encounters and Alien Abductions um, and decided I would also um, do a, a small preliminary replication of Ring's findings um, to see whether or not um, the, the data holds uh, hold um, and and some does the vast majority do do hold, but some of the key findings around dissociation don't hold, uh, and so um, I'm working with MUFON now in the Abduction Experiences Research Committee, um, and teaching the course on the U University of Great Falls distance education platforms, um, uh, starting in the fall. Uh, so it's something that's been with me, but it was only in the last. Um, I'd say 12 to 14 years that I decided as a, a, a tenured faculty member um, I didn't have to worry about politically correct research, politically correct statements, um, and um, got a tremendous amount of support from the university for, for doing the research and also doing um, the course. And the course is a good seller for both undergraduate and graduate students. How, how extensive is the the uh, scientific information or data on abduction. It's, it's fast becoming an area of, of greater interest um, in the social sciences. It still lacks, I think, a significant body of, of empirical evidence. Um, what happens is you get a study um, like the Rodinger study or a study uh, like Ring and Rosen, um, and people respond to it. Um, but the responses t tend to be what I call the Louvre's second law of research. Um, for every finding, there's an equal but opposite finding. People react and try to poke holes in the data. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't holes in the data. But I would say in the last 20 years, um, the number of, of social, scientific, um, and uh, quality humanity studies of the ph phenomenon are increasing every year. Um, I think there are probably a 75 fairly well-designed, internally valid studies um, uh, in the area. But when you consider that eyelid conditioning um, in learning theory has probably 75,000 studies, um, it's still got a way to go. I think we deal with a person who reports an abduction the same way we deal with anyone who has had um, a, a stressful conflict, a trauma-ridden um, experience. Um, I think my graduate students say it best, uh, that without exposure to the field, without exposure to the abduction literature, they would tend to probably class the, the description as some kind of delusional experience. Um, but if you listen closely, uh, and listening becomes, of course, the, the important part of any kind of therapeutic intervention, um, one can hear exactly what the person is saying. And to respond with, with res respect, um, you're always dealing with a delicate balance, I think, of, of underbelief and overbelief um, uh, as a therapist. Um, and striking the balance is, is what's crucial. You cannot reject the person. You cannot necessarily um, accept every single word as gospel truth. Um, but if you're working and trusting the person and they're working and trusting you, um, you create the narrative uh, of the experience in a way that's comfortable for them so you don't re-traumatize them. 
and also um, gives you more and more information, more and more knowledge, and hopefully you convert that to wisdom um, and, and have that as a basis for dealing with the next abductee you see. Um, I think there's also the issue of having uh, a balance um, in, in um, the practice. Um, I've always been a person that, that wanted to be eclectic in what I did in terms of therapy or teaching. Um, and I think having a number of different kinds of people who have experienced trauma of different types allows you to bring to each of the areas um, the knowledge um, and the understanding from the other areas. And so having that rich clinical practice is important um, before you actually deal with your first case. I think from, from my own experience dealing um, with that experience and, and that report um, um, is to first and foremost accept what the person is saying. Um, to accept it verbally, accept it non-verbally, uh, communicate that to the person, um, and allow the person to report, talk, and elaborate the experience um, in a way that's comfortable for them. Um, my sense is that too often, um, like the graduate students before they take the course, they're going to try to fit that person into um, one of the delusional disorder categories in the diagnostic and statistical manual. Um, um, but if they see and hear and read about the experience, um, then I think they can approach it much more open-mindedly. In the, the 32 or 3 people with whom I've worked um, in the last year, um, mostly in a re research capacity, um, there's hardly one that I would doubt the report on. Um, there's one that's pretty extreme, um, but then again, she clearly has details that are important to understand about abduction, and some of the details are known, some of them are less well known. Um, there's an extreme kind of quality uh, to her report, um, but um, I would say that, that the estimates um, of 60 to 70 to 80 percent of abduction reports are real experiences. And to class it as something that is a delusion, something that is not real, is not only disrespectful to the person with whom you're working, uh, it's closing your eyes um, um, to a real event um, that appears to be happening to a large number of people. Um, and I don't walk well in the world, I don't ride my bicycle well in the world with my eyes closed. The psychological effect of Roswell is one of those great ironies and paradoxes, okay? Um, um, its effect is much more powerful the further you get away from Roswell geographically. Um, uh, I don't know how many people who live in this city, uh, and I'm new to the city, okay, um, say, oh yeah, I heard about that. Um, and as you move further away, um, the event takes on more importance and more meaning. And I think that relates to the fact that that there has not been the kind of attention um, at, at many levels of education um, to the event. Um, the idea of these little half-hour workshops introducing ufology to the general public here in, in the Lopez room, I think is a first step in the right direction. Um, uh, I, I think that as you move further away from the city of Roswell, um, uh, it becomes more salient to people. Um, and again, there's, there's two sides to that coin. Uh, wow, Roswell. You're going to retire to Roswell? Roswell, hmm. Uh, and, and the closer you get to the, the epicenter of the city, the same kind of phenomenon. I walked out of the grocery store with a young woman pushing my cart, um, and um, she, I had my 60th anniversary cap on, and she said, Oh, aliens, um, you don't believe in that, do you? I said, well, I'm on the committee, um, and I do research. Oh, she said, I'm sorry, sir. I said, no, but come down to the workshops. Um, take a look at it. Um, how old are you? 20. What do you know about it? Not a lot. Um, but I think the experience is so salient to ufology. It is, it is essentially the gold standard. Um, 
Um, and I like the idea that, that people are debating uh, the event. Um, 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 I like that kind of healthy skepticism. But for me, Roswell, each year, more, since the mid-70s, more and more information is coming forward about the, the event. Uh, and as Stan Friedman said in this morning's paper, um, we're running a race with The Undertaker, um, and we're losing because The Undertaker always wins. Time is growing short for um, more witnesses to come forward. Um, but in addition to witnesses, there needs to be a concerted effort among all the disciplines to really understand uh, not only the psychology of the event, but the ongoing rippling psychological effect um, uh, of that event, any other event that relates to crashes, crash retrievals, or abductions. I would suggest that, that public high schools um, add readings in the area um, to their civics course or their history course. Um, um, but I fought that battle around Vietnam. Um, it took us five years to get the high schools to add more than an hour's uh, coverage of the Vietnam experience. Um, uh, it was like, oh yeah, Vietnam happened. Let's go on to other important events in American history. Um, oh yeah, Roswell happened. Um, so I think, I think the more and more people are exposed to it, um, the more and more people hear that it's, a, it's an event, it is a real event. Um, whatever it was, it's important to treat it open-mindedly. Um, but we live in a culture that, that I think um, doesn't give a lot of time and thought to things that are outside of their nomological network. I mean, my life is my college career, getting a job, making money. Um, my life is a social network on Facebook, um, MySpace. Um, um, and, and if there's a way to use those social network sites in, in new and innovative ways, to focus on Roswell and the revelations of Roswell. What has it told us about ourselves, um, both in terms of the possibility that we're not alone and how we handle disconcerting information, information that challenges the way we see things and challenges our worldview. I don't know whether the world changed in 1947 or not. I know that the world is changing now in large part it is a quest for answering the question, are we alone? But it's also the realization that there may be other intelligences that are involved with us. Are they trying to influence us? Are they observing us? Um, are they setting out to colonize us? Um, um, I think you need a balance of the X-Files um, with some skepticism to really approach the significance of Roswell and the significance of the greater um, uh, contact experience. Um, and we have to address it from a number of dimensions. One of my sadnesses um, is that we have three conferences going on here in Roswell this weekend, um, all of which have a crucial component um, to understanding the Roswell experience and the contact experience, the abduction experience. And I would love to be alive long enough to see those three conferences be a single, triple, triply focused conference. Um, um, and I'd like to think that was my mission, but I don't go on foolhardy missions. <laughs> I think it's going to be a tough sell. I think there's a paradigm problem. Uh, a paradigm shift problem. Um, I think you're absolutely right that we have tremendous difficulty as a species um, to integrate new information into um, our attitudes, our beliefs, our values, um, and that when that information is potentially transformative or potentially shattering, um, there's going to be a, a natural cognitive and emotional resistance to it. Uh, Milton Rokich wrote 40 years ago um, about uh, a bimodal um, cognitive um, distribution um, uh, in Western culture. One is the open mind, simple term. One is the closed mind. Um, 
Uh, and we think closed-mindedness tends to be rigid. I mean, we tend to think of it as conservative, um, potentially fascist. Um, what, he, what he argues is that closed minds just can't adapt to new information. Um, and one of the interesting ironies for me is some of the most closed-minded people that can't adapt to this information are the scientific community. Um, their paradigms are so well entrenched. And, Thomas Kuhn has talked about that. He's talked about that. He's written about that. Um, people have researched um, in social sciences what gets published in the journals. What gets published in the journals are things that support the mainstream thinking at the time. Um, so you have the general kind of resistance to new information, new knowledge, new wisdom. Uh, you have the scientists um, pulling that um, uh, at, a, at a greater and more significant um, level by debunking phenomena. But you do have the issue of of, and again, the government cover-up. I mean, um, it doesn't take a person with a paranoid disorder, it doesn't even take a person like me who's a natural-born conspiracy theorist, okay, to think every time the government opens its mouth publicly, it shoots itself in the foot. Um, and, you know, they don't learn from their experience either. Oh, it was a weather balloon. Oh, it wasn't. It was the Project Mogul balloon. Oh, it was the crash test dummies that weren't used until four or five years later, okay? Oh, it doesn't matter that the crash test dummies were six feet in tall um, and witnesses report something else. Um, see, again, the phenomenon is so complex and so complicated. Um, um, and this is a culture, and I'm not a social psychologist. I shouldn't really, really say this, but this is a culture that prides itself on always knowing where it's going and always being right. And 50% of the time, it hasn't got the biggest idea of where it's going, and it's wrong. Um, and that's not going to be any different when people try to come to terms with Roswell uh, and any revelation that comes from Roswell. Um, and if you add to that notion of the open and closed mind of Milton Rowe Keach, um, it's going to be a struggle. Um, but I think the salience is building. I think more people now, and I have no data on that, um, um, and I shouldn't speak without data because I'm a psychologist, but I think we know that more and more people are, are seeing things. Um, we know that there's an ever-increasing number of abduction reports. Um, um, I would like to see someone, Roper um, or any of the pollsters, uh, really deal with that acceptance question. Um, not do you believe it, because um, uh, when you talk belief, people get scared. Um, but to you, to maybe just change that one question, is, is, is it possible for you to accept the possibility that? And see where that data takes us. Um, um, it may not reveal anything new, um, considering all the polls that have been done over the last 50, 60 years. But I think you're going to see a slight increase in people for very different reasons, many different reasons, being more accepting. Um, but Plato said that, that social change comes from the margins. Um, so we don't want to make it a mainstream phenomenon yet, um, because then it will just be reified and rigidified the way other belief systems are and other po political philosophical systems are. We want those marginal insights of the experiencers, and we want that to slowly, I think, build acceptance um, and anything we can do, um, you know, from UFO hunters on television to fast walkers touched um, courses, um, the least accepting people at the University of Great Falls for, for this course, other faculty. Not the students, not the provost and vice president for academic affairs, not the registrar. The president was a little had some reservations, um, um, but it was the faculty. You know what? Yes, I'm teaching a course on. You're going to tell them it's all bull, aren't you? No. I'm going to present the evidence, and I'm going to let them decide for themselves. Uh, oh, I don't know about that, LaLuver. I just don't know about that. Um, and yet, you know, now it's catching on among the faculty. Um, and, you know, you're an expert when you're farther away from your home campus and 1,301 miles um, helps, I think, in the faculty accepting. Um, so we'll see what happens over the next couple of years. I, my sense is that one of the other paradoxes in the culture 
is the fact that we see ourselves as such individuals, okay? And yet we also are very much concerned with what our colleagues are going to say about us, what our neighbors are going to say about us. Um, and if we repeat things to ourselves long enough, I think it, it kind of dulls us. It kind of um, um, prevents us from being open to uh, sharing those experiences. Um, um, I'm new to Roswell. Two years today I moved to Roswell. Um, um, but the neighbors on my street um, are equally divided. Um, some say, what? Roswell? UFOs? Others say, you know, I've lived here for 40 years and I've heard a lot about it, um, but I'm not sure I know enough about it. Um, what are you doing to learn more about it? Um, they can't break out of that kind of fog, that kind of glue that holds them. Um, you've got a, a, an incredible library of material here at the museum. I once heard it estimated as its second largest to the Vatican on UFOs, okay? Um, um, none of the people who live on my street has visited the museum library. Um, and I think, whoa, I mean, you talk about being dulled, hypnotized, um, um, being unable to break out of a paradigm, being concerned about not keeping up with the Joneses, but what will the Joneses say um, if they see me out in my backyard or at the park reading John Mack, reading Bud Hopkins, um, um, reading about transgenic beings and UFO invisibility. Um, um, they're going to think I am. Um, and so they freeze themselves in place. Um, they can't break that kind of internal apprehension, uh, internal anxiety, uh, internal resistance. Um, uh, and I can forgive them. I mean, that's okay. It's up to us to educate them, okay? What's harder for me to forgive is for people in my discipline or any scientific discipline or the humanities or in spirituality, religion, etc., simply rejecting out of hand the possibility that this experience is real. I'm not even going to ask them to, to say it's probable, just that it's possible. Um, and that's going to be a longer and harder struggle than getting my neighbors to, to see the, the other side of the coin. Um, because people are convinced that they have the model, the discipline, the process to understand the world around them. And they'll fight to hold on to their beliefs. They'll fight to hold on to their paradigms if they're scientists. They'll fight to hold on to um, the accepted canon of knowledge. Um, and. Um, um, that's a struggle, um, and I think we need to confront that. And we each confront in our own way. Um, um, teaching students is one way to confront it, overcoming resistance of faculty. I don't have the energy to overcome the resistance of my neighbors. Um, I just have to focus on those things and those folks I know will possibly open their mind a little bit. One of the things I love is going to the public library and saying, here's my library card. I need a hard copy of Ring and Rose in 1990. Um, and being able to, to, to rely on the fact that in two to three weeks, I'll have it. Um, um, not all of the material in the area is, is electronically archived, which is unfortunate. Um, but again, there's always a backup, always a thing to do. Go to your public library. Um, uh, enroll for one continuing education course at a local university. You have library um, privileges. Um, um, our library at the University of Great Falls has every single text that I've ever used in the course. Um, um, and I've given them a list of supplementals, and, and I found out that all of my supplements, when you look at the syllabus, you'll see supplemental readings. All of those now are in the library, at least one copy. Um, and uh, I, th I think the more I can expose people to different models of, of explanation of the phenomena, the better off they'll be in making that informed choice about where they're going to go with this knowledge. Um, Ronald Lang in the 60s said, few books are forgivable. Um, few ideas are forgivable either. Um, once you've been exposed to them, you can't throw them out with the bathwater. They're there, and they'll, it'll take time to percolate them.